Good afternoon, ENG1D, Ms. Boshkoff here. Let's begin our study of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. For our study purposes, we'll be taking a look at um, Harcourt Shakespeare edition, the second edition. If you have a different edition, that's fine. It just means there might be a few little differences here and there. Let's uh, turn the pages until we get to page five here, where you will encounter the Dramatis Personae, which uh, lists the characters in the play. So again, during class, we took that there are four groups of characters, the rulers, the lovers, the Athenian workmen, and the fairies. This Dramatis Personae lists all of the characters that we're going to encounter. Whenever you start a, a play study or a theater study, it's always a good idea to start by taking a look at the list of characters so that you can become familiar with the names, of course, but also to establish the relationships that they may have with one another. So firstly, we take a look at Theseus, who is the Duke of Athens. He is to be married to Hippolyta here, Queen of the Amazons. Betrothed means that they are engaged. Next we see Aegeus, father to Hermia. Lysander and Demetrius. I have these two characters um, in a rectangles um, because they correspond to these two characters as well, Hermia and Helena. Hermia is in love with Lysander, as is Lysander in love with Hermia. All is well. In this next scenario, we have Helena, who is in love with Demetrius. However, Demetrius is not in love with Helena, and Demetrius is also in love with Hermia. So right from the very beginning, we see that there is some, some difficulties with love. The next one, Philostrate. Philostrate is the master of the revels to Theseus. He is essentially the master of ceremonies. He's like the man who is in charge of Theseus's social life. Next we see here the Athenian workers. We have quince, snug bottom, flute, snout, starveling. These individuals are um, work with their hands and they are also going to be coming together to practice a play in preparation for Duke Theseus's wedding. They're going to practice because they would like to be chosen to perform the play at his wedding. If they are to be chosen, they would receive great recognition and money. So they're excited about uh, possibly being chosen. Hippolyta, again, is the queen of the Amazons. Uh, Theseus goes, to, goes on to explain that he was earlier in a war with the Amazons um, and chooses to marry uh, Hippolyta in a different vein. He's going to show her an, a much nicer side, a much better side. Hermia and Helena again, uh, part of the lovers category up here. Next we have the world of the fairies, fairyland here. And again, this is the fairies, the group of fairies. We have Oberon and Queen Titania. They are married. However, they are having some difficulties recently in their marriage. They've come across a couple of challenges. Puck. Puck is the henchman to King Oberon. He is also known as Robin Goodfellow. Although he often is not a very good fellow, he is often quite mischievous. Uh, next we have some fairies, Peasbottom, Cobweb, Moth, Mustard Seed. There are other fairies that attend to the king and the queen, and then there are also attendants that uh, attend on Theseus and Hippolyta. Now the scene is in ancient Athens, and there is also a wood near it. We've also studied, we've taken a look a, a little bit at ancient Athens and discovered that it is a walled city. And the fact that it's a walled city will play, play some importance, some relevance uh, a little bit later on. We introduced our study of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream by taking a look at this quote by Sigmund Freud. You are always insane when you are in love. Now this quote represents one of the main themes that we will encounter in this play, the theme that um, when you are in love, you go a little crazy, or you do really foolish things when you are in love. So let's turn this page over. 
The nice thing about this edition is that it gives a little overview before you begin each scene. So let's take a look again. Here in this scene, the play begins with plans for the marriage of Theseus and, sorry, Theseus, the Duke of Athens, and his future bride, Hippolyta, who was the queen of the Amazons. They are discussing wedding entertainment when they are interrupted by an angry parent seeking justice, whose name is Aegeus. He is a citizen of Athens who demands the, the highest penalty of death for his daughter Hermia. Now Hermia has rejected Demetrius. Demetrius is his choice for her husband. Instead, Hermia is in love with Lysander and wants to badly marry him. And as we know from taking a look at the Dramatis Personae, uh, Lysander wants to marry her as well. To complicate the issue, her, her, sorry, Helena, Hermia's best friend, is in love with Demetrius. Demetrius had, in fact, flirted with Helena earlier. Um, it's suggested a little bit later on in, this, uh, in the play that he did more than just flirt. He may have actually uh, courted her and uh, possibly was, um, was engaged to her but now is attracted to her best friend, Hermia. The Duke announces his harsh judgment that Hermia faces death or will be forced to become a nun unless she submits to her father's choice. Hermia and Lysander refuse to be parted and they come up with a secret plan. So again, this introduces the theme, Fool for Love, and we did talk about this in our introduction. Let's turn the page. Act one, scene one. So we are um, in Athens. We are in the palace of Duke, uh, Duke Theseus. We enter, we see that uh, Theseus and Hippolyta enter. Um, also um, in present, or also present are Philostrate and some other attendants. Now I'm going to be using a, um, a, an, audio, um, an audio version to help us become familiar with the language and uh, the cadence of the language, um, I find that it can be really, really helpful. Now, this particular version is a taped version that I prefer to play because I can stop it a lot easier than I can a DVD. So it does at times um, skip ahead and it's not a perfect, uh, a perfect version, but it certainly is enough for us to uh, become familiar with the language and um, get to know the story, what's going on in the plot. All right, so at this point, I'm going to just have you read along with the audio. And at certain points, I will be stopping it to draw your attention to um, points of importance and also to get you to take a look at the other side where the annotations are. These annotations are incredibly important to help you understand the language. And um, because as you know, this particular version of English, there are many uh, words that have gone out of popular use. So let's get started. Our nuptial hour draws on apace, for happy moon. But Omer thinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdam or a dowager, long with ring out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Okay, so I'm going to stop it here. Here we see that Duke Theseus is getting very impatient. It is four days until he gets married. And although it is approaching quickly, it somehow seems very, very slow to him. He is incredibly impatient. He's so looking forward to getting married to her and to their wedding night. Hippolyta says, 
uh, don't don't worry so much it will pass quickly and the next thing you know it will be our wedding celebration go philistate stir up the athenian youth to merriments awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth turn melancholy forth to funerals the pale companion is not for our pump Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injuries, but I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Okay, so here Theseus is telling his social director, go pump things up out in the community. If anybody is sad, get them out of here. Being sad is for funerals, not for my wedding day, right? Um, and here again we see that Theseus... Uh, explains that I have wooed thee with my sword. Yes, I fell in love with you when we were at war, but essentially he's saying, don't worry, I'm not a brute, and I'm going to prove it to you with the best wedding a man could ever give a woman. Happy be thee, Zeus, our renowned duke. Well, thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation, come I, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. My gracious duke, this man hath witched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child and hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of my hair, rings, Gorge, conceits, necks, trifles, nosegays, sweet bits, messengers of strong prevailment in unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious joke, be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death according to our law immediately provided in that case okay this seems pretty harsh of Aegeus here he has come before the duke explaining that Lysander has made his daughter fall in love with him he has tricked her into loving him somehow and has whispered sweet nothings and words of love to her and because she is young and easily impressionable she has fallen for it in addition to that uh, his daughter has turned away from her father and refuses to marry the person that he has chosen for her to marry, meaning Demetrius. Overall, Aegeus is saying here that Lysander is a very bad influence and he is going to stick by the Athenian law that says if you don't do what your daddy tells you to do, you can get killed for it. What's this? What's this? Your father should be as a god. One that composed your beauties. Yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax by him imprinted. And within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father look but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am a bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. Okay, so Hermia here is being bold for the time. She is essentially getting pretty cheeky by standing up for herself and what she wants. Um, back in this time, of course, daughters and women in general were the objects, the possessions of the men in their life. And so the fact that she is arguing what she wants is pretty cheeky of her for sure. What she's going to do next is she's going to ask for the worst case scenario if she uh, refuses her father's suggestion. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth. Examine well your blood. Whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I, to be in shady cloister mule, to live a barren sister all your life, 
chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthly are happy is the rose distilled, than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So we Okay, so Theseus responds, you essentially have three options here. Uh, Hermia, number one, you can marry Demetrius. Number two, you can choose to go live as a nun and um, never uh, touch a man in your life. Uh, and then your last uh, option is for you to die. And he warns her to remember how young you are. And he says at the end, that he feels that um, being a nun would be a cold, boring life. Even though virgins are blessed in heaven, he thinks that it's a more exciting life to, uh, to get married. And of course he would say that because he is on the verge of getting married himself. I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take okay, so her response is, forget it. I'm not going to marry Demetrius, and so I will have to die. That's just what I'm going to have to do. Fine then, either I'll stay a virgin forever uh, or die, but I will not obey my father. Time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I, austerity and single life. Okay, so he gives her a choice. In four days, on my wedding day, you will have to give me your answer what it is that you are going to do. Are you going to marry Demetrius? Are you going to go to a nunnery and live as a nun? Or are you going to accept the death penalty? Excellent, sweet Hermia. And Lysander, yield thy crazy title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful Lysander, true, he has my love. And what is mine, my love surrender him. And she is mine. And all my right of her, I do estate unto Demetrius. I am my lord as well derived as he is well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius. And which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Okay, so Demetrius says, oh, come on, Hermia, just give it up. I, you know, it is my right for you to marry me because your father is suggesting it. Um... Lysander speaks up and says, look, I'm just as rich and aristocratic as, as Demetrius is. Um, in fact, he says, my fortune may be even better in the long run. So he's arguing why he is, in fact, the better choice. And then he says, in addition to that, and more importantly, Hermia loves me and not Demetrius. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius! I'll about you to his head, made love to Nida's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. Aha, here we have some complications. Lysander explains that Demetrius is a bit of a, of a jerk, he's a bit of a douchebag. Actually, he's saying, um, he's saying, why shouldn't I fight for the woman I love? And he says, plus I'll even say it to his face, Demetrius is a douche. He led Helena on, proclaimed his love, um, and got engaged, and then broke it off when he met her best friend, Hermia. So Lysander is saying, Demetrius is a jerk. I don't think he should be marrying the beautiful Hermia. And then he says, um, Lysander, sorry, Demetrius, can't make up his mind. Theseus is going to go on to confess, oh, that yes, he does seem to remember Demetrius coming to talk to him about marrying Helena. And so what Lysander is saying is the truth. Demetrius is an inconstant man. 
I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate, to death or to a vow of single life. All right, so this is interesting. Theseus says, um, yes, I remember that Demetrius d did come and talk to me about marrying Helena. And he says, I was so full of, you know, um, uh, thinking about my own affairs and what was going on in preparation for my marriage that I completely forgot that he did do that. Uh, then he looks at Hermia and says, listen, you need to think long and hard little Miss Hermia about what it is that you want to do and he suggests that she change her mind that she um, fit her fancies to her father's will he says or else the law of Athens will you know you only have a, a couple of choices either you will die as is the law of Athens or you will go to a nunnery he says by no means uh, we may extenuate, meaning we cannot change this Athenian law, which actually isn't true. The truth of this matter is that it wouldn't be easy for him to change this Athenian law, but because he's the Duke, he actually could change it. Is he willing to? Not right now, that's for sure. Come, my apologies. What cheer, my love. Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourself. With duty and desire, we follow you. All right, so now we see Lysander oh, and Hermia on stage. Why alone. is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? The light of the rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. She sighed. For aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. Okay, so here we have a reiteration of one of the themes, another one of the themes that we're going to encounter in our study here. The theme that true love always has problems. So remember this line here that Lysander says, it's going to be an important line. The course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood, Cross. Too high to be enthralled to low. Or else Miss Grafford in respect of years. Oh, spite. Too old to be engaged to young. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell. To choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream. Okay, so Lysander is going on to say, I understand love is difficult. And he's giving a, a bit of a list here of examples of how uh, love can be difficult in certain situations. He next says, lovers always seem to have problems. It's kind of a part of life, he says. Brief as the lightning in the collied night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, behold, the jaws of darkness to devour it up. So quick, bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies follow us. All right, so Hermia continues on this vein and she says, if lovers always have problems, then it's just normal that we do too. Let's accept our problems as a normal part of love. Lysander is going to say, that's actually really good advice, Hermia. I have a really good idea. Listen to my plan. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is a house remote, seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then, 
steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May, there will I stay for thee. All right, so this is his plan. He says, um, meet me tomorrow night. I have a really rich, uh, sorry, a really rich aunt who has no children and a lot of money. And she loves me like her own son. Let's escape. It's about, you know, five kilometers away, seven leagues. Um, let's go there. And because Athens is a city state, it has its own laws. If we leave the walls of Athens and go beyond, we will be dealing with some different, some different laws. And it means that we can get married there. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with a golden head, by the simplicity of Venus doves, by that which knitted souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever woman spoke, in that <coughs> same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. All right, so she agrees. She thinks it's a great idea. Let's run away and get married in, um, in, you know, in the next little town that has some different laws. Great idea. Next, we see that her best friend, Helena, arrives on the scene. Now, unfortunately for Helena, she is in love with Demetrius. Um, and when Demetrius, Demetrius showed a lot of interest in her too, but when Demetrius met Hermia, he dumped Helena and Helena just can't get over it. She is a fool for love. Godspeed, fair Helena. Whither away? Where are you Call going? me fair. That fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are load stars, and your tongue's sweet air more tunable than laughter to shepherd's ear when wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. Sickness is catching. Oh, a favor so, yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye, your eye. My tongue should catch your tongue, sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. Okay, so Helena's got it bad here. She just can't get over Demetrius. So she says to, uh, to Hermia, teach me what it is that you're doing that has him so obsessed with you. Teach me how to talk like you do, how to look like you do. I want to look and be like you so that I can catch Demetrius. I want to catch him like I can catch a sickness. I want to catch your beauty like I can catch a sickness. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, but your frowns would teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hates me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty. Would that fault were mine? Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then, what graces in my love do dwell, that he has turned a heaven unto a hell. Sounds great. This is, he, they share their plan with Helena. Helena is down in the dumps. Demetrius doesn't love me. Demetrius loves you. Teach me how to be like you so Demetrius will love me. And Hermia says, listen, this is really good news. I'm going to tell you what we're doing. We're out of here. We're running away. So Demetrius can be all yours. So they share the plan. Um, Hermia essentially says, I can't stay in this hell anymore. I used to love Athens. It seemed to be a, a paradise to me, but now it has become an absolute hell, and I need to get out of this place. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in a watery glass, 
decking with liquid pearl of bladed grass, a time that lovers' flight stuff still conceal. Through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of our counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander. We must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow, deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius, dote on you. Okay, this sounds pretty normal um, for best friends. So Hermia and Helena are best friends. Hermia shares her plan and wishes Helena the very best. Now that I'm gone, I'll be out of here tomorrow night. Now that I am gone, um, you will have a good chance with Demetrius. I hope everything falls into place for, you, for the two of you. Um, so in other words, I wish you happiness. And then she says to Lysander, good night until tomorrow. Um, I'll see you, you know, at midnight in the forest. Now we have Helena, who is going to give a monologue on stage, talking about how um, she is going to come up with her own plan to get Demetrius to be indebted and to appreciate her. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things bait. No quantity love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid, painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. Okay, so she's explaining um, that some people are a lot happier than others. She's jealous. She's jealous that Lysander and Hermia have seem to have this perfect love. And she goes on to explain that Demetrius um, is kind of like, is being like a child. He is, um, although he doesn't seem to love her anymore, he certainly did before. And she is going to try to change his mind. And she has a plan to do that. She's going to explain that I'm going to tell Demetrius of their plans. And in so doing, he will be so appreciative and indebted to me that at least, at the very least, I'll, I'll get to see him again. I'll follow him into the forest. Um, and he'll be so appreciative to me. It will be so nice to have him be appreciative of me. So that's her great plan, which is actually not such a great plan. It probably would have been better if she did nothing and um, and she maybe would have had a better chance if she would have just let them escape and Demetrius would have just been left alone and he may very well have come back to her. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight, thither and back again. So she is, she thinks she's come up with a good plan. <clears throat> she's going to tell him that they are stealing away. She knows that Demetrius is going to probably follow them. And, um, and she will just simply follow him into the forest as well. And hopefully gain his appreciation. And 
hopefully win back his love some way. All right, so next, here we are at Act 1, Scene 2, page 25. Let's take a look at the scene. The pictures in this edition are, are quite useful, very helpful in helping us to imagine the setting. So again, the setting is always two things, uh, time and place, the where and the when. So this next scene, when we have a different scene, it means that there is a change in either the, the, um, the uh, place or the time. So this indicates scene two, that there has been a change in the place or the time. The people have changed here and the, the uh, location has changed. So, while the lovers are escaping, the Duke's plans for entertainment for his own marriage have been made public. In this scene, a group of amateur actors plan to meet to prepare a play for the wedding. The director, Peter Quince, assigns actors for their parts. And one of the actors, Nick Bottom, enthusiastically oversteps his authority, volunteering all kinds of advice, often with comical word blunders. Now, we're going to keep uh, track just in our head of these comical word blunders. Um, they establish that, that for the most part, these Athenian workmen are kind of bl bl blubbering idiots or blithering idiots. Um, Puck. Uh, is going to later on call them like country bumpkins. The acting group agrees to meet and rehearse in the same forest into which the lovers have fled. All right, so let's turn the page and get back to act one. So again, here we have um, scene two, Athens, it's in Quince's house. Enter Quince, Snout, and snarv Starveling. This scene establishes that Bottom is actually a bit of an asshole. He is definitely a know-it-all. He's bossy, he's arrogant, he's probably narcissistic, but definitely a bit of an arse. All right, so right here we have stage directions. The names of these characters, of these Athenian workmen, reflect their occupations. Bottom is a weaver and is named after the object around which thread is wound. But it also is can be a play on words, right? Your bottom or your, your butt or your ass, right? He is a bit of an ass, as we will soon find out. Quince is a carpenter whose name means a wedge-shaped piece of wood. Snug, also a carpenter, joins pieces of wood to make them fit snugly. Snout, a tinker, repairs kettle uh, snouts or spouts. Flute is a bellows mender. The word flute comes from the Latin word blow. Bellows are used to start up a fire by blowing on hot coals. So bellows, are, they're kind of like an accordion where you open and close them and the, the air that comes out of them uh, lends oxygen to the fire and keeps it going. Starveling is a tailor and um, is associated with the popular belief that tailors were poor and thin. All right, so let's get back here to our scene. Is all our company here? You would best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit to all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day and oh, night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors and so go to a point. Marry, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and his <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Here we see that bottom is handing out a bunch of orders. And he is not the director, but he certainly is acting like he is in charge of things. And that gives us, again, a bit of um, an introduction to his personality. He is, after all, pretty bossy and, and definitely a know-it-all. Quince here says, introduces the play, that it is a lamentable comedy, which is a bit confusing because a comedy is usually quite funny. Lamentable 
the word lament means to be sad over something. So this is going to be an interesting play, to say the least, that it is going to be both funny and sad. Hmm, interesting. And that it has to do with the most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Now, if this has to do with a cruel death, it would be, it's kind of a bit of a stretch to um, think that it could be comical in some way. But when they perform it, it certainly will be. Oh, ah, a very good piece of work, I assure you, and a very. Now, good Peter Prince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Master, spread yourselves. <laughs> Answer as I call. Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready? Name what Paul I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Oh, that will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move tall. Oh, I will condone in some measure. To the rest, uh, yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play her, please, rarely, or a part of Terra Catton to make all split. Okay, so he's trying to prove how good he can play a tyrant. And he's saying, you know, I'm better at playing a tyrant than a, than a lover, but, uh, but yeah, I'll give it a go. He says, um, I could play Hercules very well. And off he goes into reciting some of, um, some of um, the, the words to, uh, to, to Her Heracles, the, uh, the play that goes along with that, the script for it. Essentially, he's bragging. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Fibber's car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fate. <laughs> oh, this was lofty. Now, name the rest of the players. This is Hercules' name, the tyrant's name. A lover is more condoling. Francis, flute to Bella's mender. Here, Peter Quinn. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. Ah, what is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, faith, not let me play a woman. We'll have a beard coming. All right, so line 42, if you look over into the um, annotations, it says, let me not, I have a beard coming. In Shakespeare's time, women's roles were played by boys or young men. So flute here, unfortunately, is elected to play the woman's role. Small one, you should play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face, let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Oh, oh Pyramus, my lover dear, my Thisbe dear, and lady dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you must play Pyramus, and flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout the Tinker. Dear Peter Quince. You, Pyramus' father. Mm. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner. Here. You, the lion's part. Oh, oh, and I hope there's a play fitted. Uh, have, well, have, well, have you the lion's part well. written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for, for, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Oh, let me play the lion too. I will roar that I would do any man's heart good to hear me. Oh. I will roar that I will make the duke say, let him roar again, let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly, you will fight the duchess and the ladies that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us, every mother's son. I grant you, friends, if you should fight the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and roar in nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? I want you will. I will discharge it in the, either your straw color beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple and green beard, or a... Your French crown coloured beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. <laughs> <laughs> but masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town, by moonlight. Ah. There will we rehearse. 
For if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. Yeah. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of property such as the play wants. I pray you, fail me not, we will meet, yeah. and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Yeah. Take pains, yeah. be perfect. Yeah. Adieu. 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 All right, so that's uh, our, se our second scene here. Bottom establishes truly that he is a braggart. He is a bit of an idiot. He is a bit of an ass. So he certainly fits his nickname, Bottom. He uh, believes that he should actually play all of the parts. He thinks he would be the best person to choose to play all of the parts because he's so much better than any of the other ones. Uh, the other options. Uh, near the end, Quinn says, all right, so these are these are your parts. Learn your lines by tomorrow night, and we're going to meet in the forest, you know, a little a little ways away. Maybe, um, um, what does he say, a mile outside of town. We're going to meet by the moonlight, and uh, he thinks it's a better, a better option uh, rather than to perform or to, to practice in town where they would be bothered and other people would... Uh, take notice and maybe even steal their idea. So interestingly enough, um, some other people are going to be in the forest at around midnight tomorrow. Hmm, I wonder if they will run into each other. Okay, so this is 45 minutes now. The rest of this period will get you to start on the analysis questions. The analysis questions you will write out in your own notes and um, uh, see if you can find some quotes from the play to provide as proof for your answers. Now, if in the question there is already a quote it means you do not need to provide a quote in your answer for the P part. So we're going to move forward. You're going to try and put your answers together using APE. And um, at the end, we'll have a quiz where I will allow you to use this whole study package to answer questions on, um, on a, a final unit test. So the better prepared you are, the more quotes you have for proof, the much better you'll do on that final unit test. All right. Peace out.